Michael Bentahar, and his 20-minute session today is titled Toward Finding the Missing Piece of Extensive Reading in IEPs, as you see on his slide, and in IEPs is Intensive English Programs. Thank you, Greg. Um, so, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So I'm happy today to present um, on a topic that is dear to my heart, extensive reading. And um, despite that closeness, I still have some questions and I'm trying to find some missing pieces about this approach of reading. And, uh, um, and I hope today we'll be able to have some insights, important insights about, about it. So I start, I'm going to start with some background about um, IEPs and then we'll see what extensive reading, which I will be refer referring to as ER, what ER is and why it's not, and maybe something from the literature, what experts say, but the meat of the, the essence of today's session is about how people or instructors agree on the guidelines, what ER is, but when it comes to implementation, that's a different story. And that is my problem with respect to intensive English programs as a setting. So I'd like to hear from you at the end. So I'll try to finish within 15 minutes for five minute discussion. Now, just as Greg said, ex intensive English programs are those programs that are based in college or university. Sometimes they function um, independently, but the goal is to orient international students, especially first year students or pre-university students to the language proficiency needed for them to integrate successfully into university life. And also they expose them to the cultural um, pieces they need for success. And more importantly for me, it's also about those study skills international students need for them to be successful in the US, for example, which is the context. So as we all know, extensive, extensive reading is more about that pleasure reading, general knowledge reading. And according to Roe, it helps lower the student's fears, reduces anxiety, and enhances motivation. And these three pieces are important when it comes to non-native speakers of English. So extensive reading is not new to, to these teachers, IP reading and writing instructors. And that's my, that, that's where I'm, that, that's my, my context because within intensive English programs, reading and writing are taught as one course. So extensive reading takes place in that setting. So we all agree on the guidelines and the principles and what extensive reading is, but there is little agreement on its implementation. And despite its many benefits, it's still criticized by some reading instructors as an approach that is far too expensive, complicated, and time consuming. And that's also an excuse for many teachers not to integrate extensive reading in their settings. Now, we know how extensive reading is more about reading widely. It helps, it's more about the large quantities of reading. It's a book, for, for instance, it focuses on general idea as opposed to intensive reading, which is more about detailed and thorough reading. And it's more about general knowledge. And one piece that I'd like us to remember is that extensive reading for it to be successful, scholars say that students should be able to understand at least 90% for some scholars like Fields 2017, for example, they emphasize that students should be able to understand at least 98% of the work. So that's, a not, that's an important criterion here. But in addition to extensive reading, some people like Fields, for example, propose a different approach, which is similar, but not, not really in the same direction. And that's extended reading. So let's take a look at what this alternative to extensive reading is. So as you know, extensive reading is, is not assigned. So it's a student's choice. Extended reading is more about the teacher selection. Extensive reading is more about independent reading, large quantities. Extended reading is short chunks of, of, uh, of readings that are chosen by the teacher. Reading at or below student level, that's more extensive, but for extended, it's more students read at a level that is beyond theirs. So that's an important difference there. And longer readings, shorter ones. And of course, when it comes to assessment, extensive reading, as far as I know, um, and that's my personal conviction as well, should not be tested or quizzed or assessed. But for extended reading, many think it should. Now, also about 
um, extensive reading. So these are some of the benefits that we that are mentioned. Grabby, for example, William Grabby talks about um, implicit learning and how extensive reading is an important approach that can help students get there. And it's more that we don't see in learning as opposed to what we highlight in class. And for me, um, last year, um, Ken Cracker and I published a piece, it's a practice based speech in a peer reviewed journal. And we talked about how extensive reading can benefit from ISA, integrated skill approach. In other words, we can make, we can always make sense of receptive skills such as reading and listening when we integrate the skills. So we students read, but for a productive skill, they can write, they can speak, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, as I said before, there's so much agreement on the guidelines and the principles related to ER, but when it comes to implementation, it's a different story. And two reasons come to mind in this regard. First is that some teachers resist having international students make that choice of, of, of selecting their books. Some teachers may think that students come from China or Saudi Arabia, maybe they're not ready enough to choose and they don't have the knowledge to, to make that decision. Not really, not sure I agree. Another, another reason, especially for novice teachers, and I noticed this, is that when novice teachers join intensive English programs, usually they are mentored. So they have a mentor and they belong to a small team under the auspices of a course coordinator. That course coordinator usually assigns intentionally or unintentionally, directly or tacitly. So there's some influence there, especially um, in the first two years of a teacher's teaching. Now, I'm going to share with you four approaches that I've seen on three campuses. And also these, these these approaches are the result of my consultations and some research work with other colleagues elsewhere. Now, it doesn't mean that I have a solution to extensive reading implementation because on myself, I'm still trying to see which one is most appropriate, hence this presentation. So I'm sorry to say that I have more questions for you than answers. And the order of these approaches is going to be random. So just to, while looking at them, just think about your situation and context, which ones work best for you. Let's take a look. So the first approach is more about um, implementing reading and writing reading sessions where the focus is on nonfiction books. And the goal is to facilitate language acqu acquisition and it encourages learner interaction and promotes fluency. That's what the teachers on this campus believe. And the teachers assign different groupings of the students to lead a class discussion on different sections of the book. And some students, some students are leading a discussion while are practicing and then they rotate. So this is a, an approach that I've seen on one campus. Another one is more about extensive and or extended reading. So it could be one of the two or combination. And as I said, extended reading here, I apologize about the, sorry about the, the typo. So it's more as an alternative here. So teachers within the same program use different approaches. And what the extended reading instructors do, it's more chapters. It's like short readings, um, authentic of course, chosen by the teacher on a topic that connects to the units the students are reading. So as you know, in intensive English program, there is that thematic approach um, used that we follow. So we have a textbook and we have units. And so chapters are selected pursuant to the units or the topic that students are examining. And of course, everything is already there. For example, it could be set in Canvas and students know that they need to, um, to study that reading, but it comes with questions. And that bothers me a little bit because here we're quizzing the students. It's not just about extensive reading, even if we use it in a different way. And um, there are also weekly discussions of the chapters, led by the teacher, of course. Another approach is follows the cho choosing one book selected by the teacher again. The teacher reads the preface, the introduction, and chapter one in class with the students. And then the students take it from there. They read on their own. So there won't be any of these in class discussions of the book because students are supposed to be reading on their own. So when they meet, the students are going to present 
on those chapters. So each student or maybe a team of students are assigned um, a chapter. They facilitate that. And you can see here they're using speaking as a productive skill using the integrated skill approach. So students read, understand the materials, but it's this time, unlike it's the previous approach, this is going to be all students reading one book, one chapter, so that when they present on chapter three, for example, the other students will have read the same chapter. So it's the same information and topic. The last one is something I've seen on a different status. And here on the one, the teacher escorts the students to the library, to the IP or the program library. They discuss some types of genres and book types. So there's a preparation for what's coming ahead of them and students choose the book. So it's more students oriented. They skim the pages during that time. And this is the critical phase because students should be given the time to negotiate and, and um, see which book works for them. And remember that, that important principle of comprehensibility of 90%, students should be able to understand at least 90 or 98% of the words, this is the time when students will examine and, and check the books and see which one is of their interests, but also which one fits their linguistic capabilities. And the, the students will choose the, the book. And so what comes next is there's an expectation of reading logs. So students should be reading and, and keeping a reading, log, a reading logs and they have weekly discussions. So. What is interesting about this approach is that students have different books selected by the students themselves. And also they read different sections. And guess what? They don't have to read the same amount because students have different reading or language proficiency abilities. So that's another thing to remember here. And they just share what they learned and what they choose to share. And of course, no assessments are involved. Now, to conclude, what I'd like to, see, to say here is that extensive reading can be always a powerful approach, but when it comes with integrated skills, we need to integrate skills. Students should be reading not only for reading purposes, but they should be reading because they will have to speak about something or write about something. And that adds more sense to the activity of reading itself. Some teachers would follow short quizzes. Others would integrate the skills by asking the students to summarize with assessment or without grade, graded or ungraded, they summarize or they can respond or they can also include what they learned in the reading, extensive reading piece in a synthesis paper, especially with advanced or pre-advanced students. Reading logs, presentations. And one thing that I've seen in um, a place here in New York is that you can, you can always have field trips. So there's a book, um, at Columbia University, for example, they took the students on a field trip where they, they checked the infrastructures and that had to do also with the book that they were reading. You can always use the meet the, the authors if possible. For example, I, um, I, was ha I, I had a book titled The Longevity Project here at, at the University of Delaware. And instead of meeting, instead of meeting the authors, I checked a, an NPR video or an interview with the books, with the book of the Longevity Project. And the students were reading this one book, the Longevity Project. They listened to the interview on NPR, all of it. And they also listened to what the speakers and the, the guests and the questions they had on live. And then they came up with their own questions. So it's always great for the students to see that the book they're reading extensively is something that is being discussed on national TV or radio. So it's, it, 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 and they also, it's also great when the students see that what they're reading is something other people in other parts of the world, that's something that makes sense to them. And here's another reminder for all of us that the choice of the book, if the teacher chooses the book, that has to be done meticulously because the student's interests should be taken into account. Now, are we going to grade extensive reading tasks or not? A that's a question for you. And I just want to conclude that all these approaches, so all these approaches are, have strong rationales, 
all these teachers have great intentions, good intentions for their students. But for me, in Delaware, I'm still trying to find that missing piece. So you can help me with that if you have any personal experiences and maybe which of these work best for you. And I think that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to stop the share. So we still have we still have five minutes.